hi folks. You're very welcome to the Royal the Hall in the Royal Spa in Liston Varna. Um, it's great looking out at you. Uh, so my name's Pat and I'm an organizer. And uh, you could say something else there very easy, but uh, with the crowdies that are here. But uh, <coughs> it's a it's it's a pleasure to see such a great crowd here for for the two Norries. Just have to do a little bit of housekeeping to let you know that the exits are on the behind some of you and in front of others on the left and on the right, <laughs> and there's a door there as well. So if anything happens, make sure you find one of those doors. It's very important. Um, just. If you can, when you're leaving the leaving the seats, if you can wear a mask when you're going to the bathroom or whatever, uh, and that's that's you know, and just be careful around the whole COVID situation. Still, um, it's important for the venue that it remains open. Um, so, I got to know the two Norries through the podcast, like everyone else, and uh, got in touch with them a good while ago, and and started chatting with them and said to them one one day, would you be interested in doing a live podcast in Clare? Now, I know how difficult it is for Cork people to cross the border, like, but, <laughs> but, but they agreed reluctantly. They brought their passports with them, so they will get back in. And, uh, but but um, they're, they're doing really important and good work for people around the country and, uh, and pr probably further afield. And uh, so it's, it's kind of really important now that you know, people become aware, and the lads are bringing that awareness to all of us. So, without further ado, I'm just going to introduce James Leonard and Timmy Long, the two Norries. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. Hello, one, two. Hi, everybody. Oh, Liston Varna. <laughs> do Liston, Liston Varna. Up in the lady. But uh, Jesus, it's great to be here, isn't it? It's brilliant. Thanks this very much for travelling as well for all the Cork people and I beyond. Know, uh, hey. um, anybody here not from Cork? Yeah. Keep hey! That. Hey! But um, this is our very first live indoor podcast. You're all very welcome tonight. And uh, small but nervous, mm -hmm. only because we want to do as best as we can for you. So um, I just want to thank, before we get going, thank Pat for the invitation, um, Paddy and Anne of the Royal Spa Hotel, and Sarah and Jolene and everybody else who uh, made us feel really welcome yeah. this weekend. So uh, thanks to them. Thank you. Without further ado, I'm really looking forward to this. So, Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan is a lecturer in Maynooth University. She's got an amazing story, not the traditional route to Trinity College Dublin, but a very um, interesting route that she's going to tell us all about. So, can you please give a warm welcome to Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan. <laughs> Can you hear me? Perfect, perfect. Great. She Hi. looks great, doesn't she? Yeah. Thank you. I got my hair done. <laughs> so, to get going, okay, I know you through Twitter, mm. because you can be quite uh, vocal on that. Really? <laughs> <laughs> me? But you do a lot of, you do a lot of research um, through your work as an academic on topics that we touch on every week. Mm. So it was really uh, a matter of time before we could get John but I wanted it to be big because mm. you deserved to have the big stage. So yep. that's why you're on the live show, so you're very welcome. Yeah. Hey! Yeah. Thanks very much. So I met, you, I met you last week and had a great conversation with you. Mm. So for the people that don't know you, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, where you were born, where you grew up? <laughs> yeah, so doctor, I love doctor. <laughs> I love, lead, I love lead, leading with that. I don't actually have it on any documents apart from my Little Woods catalogue. Because <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing, but uh, I am quite proud that I actually am a doctor because uh, no one in my family or community probably ever dreamt that that was possible. And if you'd have known me 25 years ago, <laughs> you definitely would not have thought it. So, yeah, Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan, I was born in England, in the Midlands, Coventry, to an Irish family. So my dad was 
proud dub and his family's from Kerry. And my mom is actually born in the UK, but her dad and family were th from Athai. So we grew up in Coventry and Birmingham. And um, yeah, well, we grew up like an Irish family. Yeah, what was it like growing up in Coventry and Birmingham? Was it a lot of Irish families? Yeah, loads. Like actually where we lived, it was actually like loads of West Indians and loads of Irish families. There was loads of dope smoking and loads of drinking. Cricket and all <laughs> Loads of cricket, loads of Bob Marley and the Furies being played and a little bit of crazy songs being sung at six o'clock, two o'clock in the morning about being killed by the Brits and all this kind of stuff. And when you have a British accent, you kind of get a bit offended by that, even yeah. though you don't know why. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we grew up, it was a real, actually, you know what? Um, sometimes it's hard to talk about where I grew up because it, I talk about it like it's this negative place because it was really hard and disadvantaged and broken but like there was so much love in my community like I had it my best friend was uh, this Irish family next door I thought they were really well off the dad was an alcoholic and the ma was like trying to hold the kids together Shelley Kavanagh was my best friend but we lived in a road that was like black families Asian families and it was it was actually it was actually really fun mm. growing up there and um Many siblings. So it's five of us. So uh, four, three, two brothers before me. I'm the middle child. That's what happened. Yeah, I'm always the middle child. Yeah. <laughs> two older brothers and then me and then my younger brother, Darren. And then my sister came along about seven, eight years after us. So it's kind of, it's weird. She's like the little, the little shakings of the bag, mm. the add-on at the end. But when, when I think about, I suppose, the hard times of when I was younger, she doesn't... She doesn't feature that much because she was so much smaller than us. Mm. But uh, yeah, there was five of us. What was it like uh, in primary school for you? You know what? I absolutely loved school. We were talking about this earlier, Timmy. Like I grew up in a family where my mum and dad were heroin addicts from as far back as I can remember. So my earliest memories are finding my dad overdosed with a needle in his groin and... But school was like heaven, because you got fed. <laughs> there was food, and it was warm. I remember my first day of school. I actually clearly remember the teacher. Her name was Miss Arkinson. She was Irish. And she loved me because she knew I was Irish. So you know the way the Irish sit together. Yeah, yeah. Wherever you are in the world, you Pretty find clannish. an Irish person. But she obviously knew. I know now she knew that I was really suffering. But she was just this kind, warm woman who made me feel like there was nothing wrong with me. And I think even when I started school at age five, I knew there was something wrong with me and there was something wrong with my family. Mm -hmm. And anyone who ever made me feel like that, I fucking hated them. But mm -hmm. she just was really warm. So school, primary school was actually a lovely experience. Until my brother came a year later and he was fucking crazy. And we used to have to, like our school was open plan. Back in the eighties, they had this mad idea to just like petition with small little squares. So like, I'd be over here going, teach me, teach me. <laughs> and my brother would be like, fuck off, <laughs> over in the corner. And I'd be like trying to go, Darren, stop <laughs> missing. What was it miss, <laughs> you know, so. Once he came, it was tough. And like I remember he used to get locked in the principal's office. Her name was Miss Hooley. And they used to lock him in because he was... He probably... Nowadays, it'd be ADHD or mm. some other diagnosis. But at the time, he was just traumatised. Mm. So school was great, apart from him. If he'd have just fucking behaved himself, know, yeah. it would have been a lot better. But I love learning. Um, school was like a refuge. Yeah, it was a refuge. It wasn't with the friends that I had. Like, I didn't... So it was, but there was a lot of shame as well. So like I used to wet my bed a lot and my mom and dad didn't wash me. And so I smell like, cause, and kids don't like smelly kids. Mm. And so I was like pissy pants. And so like I was separate, mm. but I loved learning and I found refuge in reading and any teacher that like liked me, I was like alive, you know? Um, so school was a refuge in some ways, but in another way, it was another place that I just felt really lonely because I couldn't, I didn't belong. I, I remember vividly, we had this teacher, she looked like, um, she looked like Princess Diana. I don't know, I don't know, she just did. She was mm. tall and she had this blonde hair, but I remember one day I arrived in school and she called me into the bathroom and um, she had these, she had these knickers and they had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday written on the front and a little girl on them and she says I'm going to teach you how to wash yourself and every morning when you come in 
I'm going to get you to come in here. Now, she didn't shame me, which was nice, but that is shaming. Mm. Where no one else was going in the bathroom to have a wash. And mm. so primary school was isn't lovely. It, isn't it sad, though, because mm. Katrina, you know, is a very dignified woman. Well, um, you don't know me that well. <laughs> <laughs> My husband might say different. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Hopefully he, he does. He give us the dot afterwards. <laughs> yeah. the, the director's cut. <laughs> but um, to think of, yeah, in that situation, yeah. you know, where you've been called those names, and you know, I've had uh, people in my class, and that, and they do stand out yeah. for, for bullying and stuff like that, and it's just a very sad thought, mm. you know, to think of you yeah, in that situation. Yeah. And you know what's, it's, what's sad about it is that it's still happening. Mm. So I'd love it to be like that was in the 80s, but when I was even in my 20s living in Dublin, in Dublin 1, there was a little couple of little kids who were in exactly the same situation as me. They were in my son's class. I remember going in for his parent-teacher meeting and they were like, he's fucking wild. I was like, oh, no, another Darren. <laughs> but, uh, but the one thing she said to me was, but, like, he's really kind to these two lads whose parents were addicts. And I didn't care that he was wild or cheeky because I was just glad that he wasn't the one... Calling yeah. them, but yeah, that was a, it. Was a, it was an awful experience, and I think as a kid, like I, you, you think it, there's something wrong with you. Mm. I grew up thinking there's something wrong with me because nobody loves me, mm. and I know that's real sad, and I feel sad saying it, mm. but that doesn't never go away bec- when a kid goes through that. So yeah, I'm dignified now. I to wash. Don't piss my bed anymore. Mm. Well. No. <laughs> Hopefully not anyway. <laughs> but, but you also learn to live with that kind yeah. of feeling because I can completely relate to that. Yeah. Like uh, the, the feeling of not being loved as a child mm. and, and bringing it into your adulthood. But um, like when you see another child then in the area, like you can really have a lot of compassion and empathy for that child because you know what's ahead of them. Yeah. Because you know they're going through the same thing mm. as you because you can see it in their facial expressions, yeah. their demeanor, their shy. You know, the head is down, the shame, mm. you know, so... Yeah, it's tough. But the thing about that is as well, like, even though I was that kid, I was ashamed and I felt unloved. And there was also other... There was another part of me, like, I loved singing and dancing and reading and sport. I was determined. I was fiery as hell. So I had all... Like, even though I had all this kind of brokenness, I also had this other... I, ha- I had me. Mm. You know, I was still there. But the other thing I always ha- also had was... I always felt like, especially in the early years, something's going to happen. It's going to get better. Yeah. I had this like real hopeful kind of um, outset when I was younger, really younger. Mm. And the worst part about, I suppose, my experience as a kid is actually when that went. Because I think when you're living in poverty, like I, I'm educated now, so I understand loads of things I didn't know then. And back then I thought it was something to do with me that I was doing something to make my parents not not care enough about me to feed me, let's say. But then I also thought I was doing something to make that teacher be horrible to me because she didn't understand. I remember like the teachers used to be angry because I didn't have pens and paper. But like I didn't have a fucking dinner. Yeah. But I was like in a system where I was like, so my mum and dad are not love me. The parent the schools are treating me like shit. Like we had the police coming all the time. And they were treating us like shit as well. Mm -hmm. They used to shame us. So I had all these evidence that there was something wrong with me. And when you're a kid, all you think about is yourself. When you're an adult sometimes as well. (laughs) But when you're a kid, it's all... You think you've you've the big power. And Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what my point was there. But but yeah, it's just the child will always blame themselves Mm. because, say, the parent is screaming and roaring at them. The child will think that they're bad is because they're doing something wrong and they just carry that belief then yeah. that there's always something wrong nothing good is ever going to happen you know yeah. so it just continues really doesn't yeah. it even in psychology and your psychologist but like biologically they don't have the capacity to for critical thinking so when something happens they can only you know say it's my fault you know yeah, yeah. it's very kind of um egocentric stage of your development. That's you know? it. Nice little word there, wasn't That's it? a good one. <laughs> you passed the course. You passed the course, James. Seventy percent for you. <laughs> but egocentricity, that's right, yeah. That's a Piaget theory, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Well you know, actually that's the truth. Like kids can't see outside of themselves. That's why when you have a two year old and you're trying to get them to self regulate, they can't self regulate. Mm. They don't have the cognitive capacity and it's the same between the ages of two and mm. seven. Like you think that the world is 
connected to you and anything that happens then is down to you you've mm. you've done that so if good things happen yeah. which in normal healthy development they do you go oh i'm amazing look at me i made my mom love me and i i'm shining but if your mom is like fucking prostituting herself and your dad is in prison you're like I'm, i made this happen mm. what's wrong with me what's wrong with me what's mm. wrong with me and i remember that going around and around in my head it's like what is wrong with me why did this happen and then when you've nowhere to go with that literally nowhere it just becomes like a mm. a tune that mm. plays in the back of your mind do you want to tell us a little bit about your mother and father like what were they like in the house and did you have a good relationship with them yeah so you know what the one thing that worries me about addiction is like addiction is horrible but like addicts are people and my mom and dad were a complex amazingly fucked up individual people so, sorry, am I allowed to swear, by the way? So I've said about seven already. Swear away, swear away. So um, I swear when I lecture as well, yeah. and I, I feel comfortable enough now, because I love it as well. Yeah. I love seeing the middle of class people in the audience go like this. <laughs> oh, geez, she said cunt. She said cunt. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm privileged now I can say that and not feel ashamed. Um, but, yeah, so my mom, my mom was actually... My mom, it's hard to talk about my mom. They're both dead. My mom mm. died... My dad died about 10, 10 years ago now. My mom died. And I, I actually feel sad when I say that. My yeah. mom died. My mom died in active addiction. She died, actually. Her liver failed. She bled to death. She was using gear at the age of 60. She got clean for a good while and tried her best. But as, as young people, like, my mom and dad were cool. You know, smoked weeds. We danced. We drank. They drank. We watched. They danced. They loved each other. They were funny. My dad was really clever. He was probably the cleverest man I've met, and I've met a lot of clever people. Um, so they were really great people and loving and open and vibrant, but they were also addicts, and the fucking hell, they did everything they could to get stoned. Mm. And so my dad was a liar. My dad was a cheat, and he was a robber, and he was a shit robber, because he went to prison a lot of the time, and he sold drugs, and my mom was really selfish, and she didn't know how to love us. Mm. And so we had this like, but my mom felt guilty a lot. Mm. I think that guilt actually killed her in the end mm. and also her mental health and whatever else. So they were complex people, but I, I am grateful. Like my mom's funeral, it was funny. It was, I don't know, I didn't realize that I was in a church. And um, well, and I said, fuck in the, when I was speaking, cause I, I, everyone used to say, oh, you're like your dad. Cause my dad, he's the type of addict that he'd blag you. You know, you wouldn't, you kind of go, is he? What the hell? Because he, he used to wear Crombie and all, and, you know, he did credit cards, so he could hold it. Mm. My mom's just crazy. Like, she just used and went mad, and that was it. Mm. So, but my dad was like, so you always felt a little bit, like, bamboozled by him. Do you know what I mean? And I did. So, like, I, people used to say to me, because I'm vivacious and I can speak and I'm clever, oh, you're like your dad, you're like your dad. But when my mom died, and I was actually able to start recovering from the fact that she just continuously put a load of shit on me, I realized that like my mom is the person that I am most like. And when I, when I said at her funeral, what I said at her funeral was like, I'm so grateful that my mom taught me how to say fuck you. Because mm. that's what she taught me. Out of everything else that she taught me, she taught me to say, no, she said fuck you for the wrong reasons. Mm. But for me, like, I was able to take from her this strength of like, no, I'm going to fucking do this. You're not going to break me. And she, so I'm grateful for that. Mm. So I like to think that I'm actually more like her than, than him because he was a fake. Mm. And I, but when we were younger, like I idolized my dad. But like, I feel emotional actually. Mm. And it's all right to be emotional. Yeah, like I want to feel this. Your family, like. Yeah, but my dad, when we were kids, like you're addicts, so you know this, like my dad brought a stability. With addiction, when a man is there and a woman are together and they're both using, it's fucking crazy, right? And the kids are crazy and everything. But like, there's a protection, I think, from the man for the woman because he's going out and trying to get the gear and do all the stuff and she's at home maybe using and drinking, but there's this protection. But when he was gone, she just fell to pieces and all the bad stuff, the really bad stuff that happened to us happened then. Mm. And so like I idolized him, I longed for him to be and I worshipped him and I wanted him to love me like so much. So I was like his little fan. 
So I loved my dad, sometimes blindly, mm. and I still love him. Like, you know, my dad turned his life around and did a lot of stuff, but it's complicated when you're a kid. Mm. One thing I said to you last week was, and I wanted to talk about on the podcast, was like, loving people that hurt you is a really hard thing to live with. To actually stay in a relationship with people who regularly hurt you. And I loved my parents. And because I loved them, I hated myself. Because I wanted to just say, fuck you, get out of my life, I hate you. But I couldn't let go of them, because they were the people that, they were the tree that I fell from. Mm. And I never, I never wanted to let go of that. I always hoped that they would get better. Am I talking too much? No, no, no. <laughs> It's like, that's the head, shh, don't tell the secrets. I know, I know, but look, you're, you're speaking really well, and I yeah. understand it's a lot of it's personal stuff, and mm. it's hard to speak in front, but you're doing really Do you well. Know, because you're in recovery yourself, you're in recovery. Yeah. Yeah. And you could look back at your own life, you could look at your parents and know that they were striving from alcohol and drugs and mm. how hard it is to get away from it, and you, because it's selfish, it's very selfish. Mm. Does that give you a little bit more compassion? around their situations and maybe looking into their own backgrounds and their own childhoods about the, whatever may have happened to them as kids. Does they have more understanding of why they became the way they did as well? It's an interesting question actually because like when you say I'm in recovery, I always kind of rail at that because mm. I don't own that mm. myself. So I'll talk to you about that again. But yeah. I, so I, I, I imagine it to be, when I went to college, and got educated about psychology. Like, obviously I did psychology because I wanted to know why everyone's fucked up and why I am. And like, that was the drive. I loved it. It was yeah. stimulating. My brain was fast and going. But like, there's three journeys in me. There's three journeys. There's child Katrina. That no matter how much knowledge I have yeah. about trauma, about my mom and dad, there's that sad girl yeah. that just wasn't loved. Mm -hmm. And like, so that doesn't, that doesn't make it any easier for her. It actually can sometimes make it harder. Mm -hmm. Cause you like, I could excuse, like with my mom, I could excuse, she was traumatized too. She was an addict, she was this, that and the other. So I could excuse it and stay yeah. in this dynamic. So there's that, that child that all the knowledge in the world is never gonna say, is never gonna make up for that loss. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, and so like I've had to learn that I have to go to that and heal that. Yeah. And no matter how much I can explain what my mom did, my dad did, or where they come from, it'll never. Mm -hmm. So knowledge is nothing. Knowledge is amazing because yep. it's actually yeah. helped me change my life. Yeah. And it's actually helped me help other people in whatever way I can, but it's never, it's never f fixed that. Yeah. What's fixed that in some ways is actually going on a journey myself and having to go into therapy and talk and share and be honest and cry and scream and all that other stuff to get to that. But it never, mm -hmm. no, knowledge, actually knowledge sometimes is worse. Because yeah. I can live in my head. Mm -hmm. I can go analyze, analyze and not feel, mm -hmm. not feel the reality it's of the it. It's the feeling, it's the surrendering into the mm -hmm. feeling, is the, that's the, the healing really. Yeah. That's how that child is going to heal. Mm -hmm. It's when all that stuff comes up for the child and you know the difference that is the childhood stuff. Yeah. Because if, if it was stuff that when you went through in your adult life, you know that by surrendering into it, you're going to be able to deal with it and, and free yourself from it. But it's the trapped emotional stuff from the childhood that some of it you mightn't even know where it came from. No. You know, and it's just there where, where you feel sad and you don't know why you feel sad or you feel bad. You know, I f there's a self-critic about something, or the shame, the, the, yeah. the, 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 yeah. the shame is a massive thing. When you don't know where it came from. Exactly. You know, and, and it's coming up and you say, why is this here? I know. Why is this, it, like what I've built into me is to just the word surrender. I've yeah. just, every time it happens, it doesn't matter how strong the feeling is. It doesn't matter if I feel like I'm going backwards after taking a forward step, I just say, oh, wait, this is how I'm feeling today. It doesn't matter. Tomorrow's going to be different. But it's just like stepping back and just feeling it. And when I go into that place and start feeling it, I'm releasing some of that trapped energy, which is from an experience mm -hmm. of, in childhood, which was some form of trauma. It may have been uh, a physical a traumatic experience, an emotional one, whatever, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. There's freedom in that word surrender for me. And, yeah. and, and that is... That, that word for me was poss possibly 
the hardest word for me to understand because surrender was not in my vocabulary growing yeah. up because I had to fight for absolutely everything. Exactly. For food, to, to survive, to bullies, you know, and for family, home, yeah. everywhere. Mm. And the word surrender to me was like, give up. Yeah. But little did I know, um, and I only realised the last few years, I was never going to live my life if I didn't really surrender into that. Mm. feeling, you know, because that was where the personal growth for me was going to be. It was in the surrendering into the way I was feeling. Mm. Yeah. Because the, the the knowledge wasn't doing it for me anymore. I was going mm. to counsellors for years. I could hurt this for years and I just felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. Yeah. Because it, it was I still felt like I was shit. Yeah. And no good. That feeling that you're no good. I know. That you nobody will love you. And you know I could relate to the feeling of love because yeah. if you're not getting it growing up Mm. You know, because of the actions of the adult in the family home or whoever, the teacher, uh, it, because of their actions, you're going to believe that you're bad. Exactly. You're being treated like that. It's not because they're sick or their mental health is bad. It's because you're bad because you don't understand that this person is sick. Exactly. You know? so. What's interesting about what you said there, though, is I always think, you see, when you said about fighting mm. and not surrendering, like, I would have been, a, I'm still a fighter. And it's like a natural a natural, I think when you grow up like I did, it's an, you're, you're on God. Yeah. You know, you're always on God. And sometimes, like, the fights that you're in now, I'm in, not you, because I don't know about your fights, not yet. There's but, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the fights, sometimes I think we, we can recreate the fights and the battles because it's what we're used to. You know, you become, like, girls like me, we're, like, mouthy and fucking this and that. You know, there's a bad reputation that are attached. But, like, little do people know that that's, that's the thing that gets you through. Like being the fighter, being the mouthy one, being the, the one who's on edge, who's ready, mm. you know, and sometimes it's very hard to surrender. You can't, like for me, I, I still haven't surrendered in some ways. It still comes up. But one, so like surrender, saying it in my life hasn't always been equal to doing it. Because I'd often find myself in very familiar situations. Like the same feelings are going on. I was like, did I recreate this? This feels like yesterday or 20 years ago or fucking 40 years ago. But like there's a, there's a pattern that comes embedded when I think you've had nothing, really nothing, and that you've had to just keep going and keep going and keep going. And it's really hard to surrender that. Mm. And it's only been since my mom died, I'd say, that I've surrendered more than I've ever been able to. And I'm scared fully sometimes because then... Or, you know, will I just be a jelly on the floor <laughs> and not no longer have, you know, no longer have that fight to get up? Because sometimes it's still hard to get out of bed. I think the, the surrendering, how I kind of interpret it is, um, it's like a kind of an acceptance or something, you know? Mm. It's like, in, when I was in addiction, I was driven by my emotions. If I didn't feel up there on the day, I didn't do it. If I committed to something and then on the day, I felt down, depressed, sad, angry. I would just act on that. Mm. But what I think I learned in treatment and the personal development afterwards is you can feel angry, sad, depressed on any given day and still go about your day. Yeah. Just accept it. Mm. It's there. Definitely. But still go about your business. Mm. As soon as I got that, I was able to commit to a job. I was able to commit to college and do mm. long-term projects mm. with confidence that there's no matter how I'm feeling on any given day, I'll just accept it and move on. Mm. And everybody... In this room, not everybody has an addiction, but we can all get depressed and sad and angry, but you still have to go about your business because if you're driven by your emotion, mm. it only ever got me in prison and treatment centres. But can we go back to you and tell us a little bit about your teenage years? <laughs> no. We digressed there for about half an hour. We're, we're good for the old digressing and the part in the two One narries. thing about that though, James, can I just say, like, you know, we're really in the minority. We're really in the minority to be able to, to do that. Like, there's loads, like, my brothers, sisters, family, friends, people I grew up with, like, we're privileged to be able to know that. Because, like, this is not normal. It's not normal for an addict to actually get to the point where they can go, oh, gee, my feelings shouldn't direct my whole fucking day. Yeah. Like, the majority just keep going forever. Yeah. And so, like, it's very rare that you we get to the point where we can actually process and go on and change and control it or move on and, from and it. I'm working in the drug and alcohol services and I, I understand that and that's why I feel so grateful. Yeah. Because same. how come I was relieved of the obsession to use and so many people didn't. Yeah. And friends that I had that died and you know, people from my neighbourhood that passed away that I would have used with 
Like why me? You know, but I think it, when you have when you have that understanding, it gives you a, a, you know a, a good sense of gratitude for oh, everything yeah. you have. Not like um, a grateful slave, but gratitude. You know, for the, just to be able to go about your daily business and not be driven by addiction and, and the, the devastation that comes with it. The only reason I say that is because the one more thing I worry about is that people look at me and go, or is I'm used as this easy? Co- oh, she did it. She did it, you could do it, to all the people, because it's fucking not easy to get out of that life. You mm. know, it's really rare and really not easy. So I, I'm always worried whenever I speak about my story that some middle-class twat who's making fucking policy decisions is going to go, well, look at Dr. O'Sullivan. She made it. Why are them other fuckers not pulling their socks up and doing it? Mm. You know, I'm actually an anomaly. Mm. I should be dead, probably. It's not normal that I'm here. And I don't, even in addiction, most addicts, don't get to that point where they can reflect enough and go and that's unfortunate and that's a system failure Mm. it's not their failure that they're not able to reflect it's the system failing them and not giving them enough empowerment to be able to get to the point where they can say i can get out of bed or whatever so that's the reason why i always say it because i'm like hate the idea of being heralded and it's mm. not, e- it's, it's really hard. I like, know, but we, we can sometimes become the rod to beat the rest of them. I know. Which, and we, a lot of the time, we, we get um, loads of comments from family members, my son, my daughter, my wife, my husband, an addiction. Um, but we don't have all the answers. Yeah, we, we got through it, but you know, the stars aligned at the right time. We had the right psychologist or the treatment centre. But yeah. if somebody rings us looking for help, there's no quick way of getting treatment. Mental health services no. are practically non-existent. Six months waiting list to get into a residential treatment centre. Mm. So that's the reality. So it's not like, oh, James and Timmy got it. How come all the rest of them are still using? It's exactly. way more complicated than that. Oh, it's really hard. Your yeah. teenagers. Teenage years. <laughs> So I was fucking mad. <laughs> I was mad. As That's teenager. why you're on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Teenagers. There's no oh, sane Jesus. people on this podcast. So Dave, my husband now, just just close your ears a little close bit. Close your now. ears, Dave. I talk about the men. I'm only joking. Um, so yeah, no teenage. So yeah, grew up like my house was mad. We sold drugs, so we were like the local drug dealers. Our house. We actually moved from Coventry to Birmingham when I was my mum and my mum and dad. My dad got out of prison. My mum went on methadone, and then we moved from Coventry. Geographical is what it's called now, but we moved from Coventry to Birmingham, which is like from moving from Dublin to Cork, let's say. And um, we got a lovely council house, and it's really nice roads, this really nice estate. It wasn't like a council estate, it was private, but ours was council. And uh, it just we just turned, ours turned into this shithole house uh, in all the nice houses. So, like, we had this, like, the grass was this long, there was old cars on the drive, and then the next door neighbor was like this little old lady who fucking hated us. And we'd be, you know, selling drugs and stuff. Now, in the middle of it, so that my mum got clean, my dad, they, they turned from smack to, to drink, which actually is 10 times worse. Give me a heroin addict parent any day. Alcohol just goes out on the streets and everybody knows. Um, and so, yeah, they were crazy. We were all crazy, actually. And I was like, I was great at everything I did. Honestly, I was like great at sport, I was great in school, I was good talk, I loved singing, dancing, I was like this fucking high achiever, I'm going to be amazing at everything. Um, and I did, never did anything I wasn't good at, so I don't know if I wasn't actually good at anything, because if I just tried it and I wasn't good, I never did it again. I still like that now. Um, but I, so I was in school, 12, started school, still the same, pissy, pissy cat, you know, like no, friendships were hard. Um, but I tried. I was really like, I loved school. I loved it. Loved English reading, but I was ashamed. I used to pretend I didn't read because mm. my friends would fucking slag me. Like, mm. you know, you're not. It's not cool to read Shakespeare. But I loved Shakespeare. My dad, the blessing of my dad was he was an avid reader, and he. I used to read the Bible every night. Like we didn't have a lot of books in the house because we weren't didn't have a lot of money, but I had a Bible that I used to read. My husband is be slagging me because I know all the Bible stories. He's a fucking Catholic and I'm not. And he doesn't even know who Mary's sister is. Her name's Elizabeth, if everybody doesn't know. But uh, yeah, so I uh, I was really into reading, really in but like my t- you know when you get to 13 and you're a girl, I don't know, boys, girls, boobs, hair, no clothes. I was like, shit, oh, boys, I need to be cool, I need to, and then, but I didn't have no money or no nothing, and I was like really fucked up and insecure, and I was like, right, you have to get yourself a really cool boyfriend. <laughs> if you get a really cool boyfriend, then, you know, you're safe, mm. you know, and I met my son's dad, so I was 13, he was 15, he was the best robber, 
the best robber. <laughs> he robbed a Subaru Impreza. Whoa. And he crashed it. <laughs> and he got away. I was like, whoa, you know, he's for me. Light shone down. Mm. Thank God I don't have that choice of men anymore. <laughs> but yeah, so but I so at that at 13, angst, angst, shame, but also cool and mm. this, you know, using drugs, smoking weed in the gaff. Like all my friends thought my parents were the best parents to have. Because you would all bring your friends over. Yeah, and we'd all smoke and drink and everything in my house and have parties and listen to Fleetwood Mac all night long and Dr. Hawk and they'd be dancing and we'd be putting on shows for them. And so, yeah, I went on a mad one. Like, it was the 90s, raving, naff-naff jackets. Mm. Fucking how did... Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Skinnier then, boob tubes, uh. raving, ease, ecstasy, mental. And I hated myself. Hated myself. Hate taking drugs, felt ashamed. It was disgusting. I was just like them, mm. you know. But there was another part of me that was like just loved being away. I had developed at that point a, a really serious eating disorder, and I don't talk about that a lot because I remember finding sugar when I was about eight. Sugar sandwiches. I used to hide in the cupboard. So all we had was bread and sugar. Salt and vinegar sandwich I tried once, but it's not very nice. Don't try it. Well. Sugar in the cupboard. So me and my brother, I used to lock myself in the cupboard and eat sugar, loads of sugar. And when I was in my teens, like that really took off. I was making myself sick and overeating, undereating. Bulimia. Bulimia, yeah, but r no one knew it. I had this friend, Michelle, she used to do it too, so we used to do it together. It's like, you know, the cool thing to do. Mm. But it was all about just trying to escape. I didn't know that though. Mm. I was just like messed up. Um, and I had a, you know what, I had some really positive experience. I want to say one really, really positive experience I had. I loved English in school and I loved, and so my, my report cards always read, Trina has loads of potential. However, mm. <laughs> she needs to attend more or stop talking or, you know, this, that, and the other. But I had this teacher, Mr. Pickering, and I talked about him before because he just absolutely met me where I was at. And I think in our life, we just don't get enough adults who meet kids where they're at. Teachers, the majority of them, I'm not going to say too much, Go are, don't understand poverty. They don't understand what it's like to go to school without love and to not care that you haven't done your Irish or your maths. So they don't get that. They mm. think they're trying to fill this kid up with all this information without actually just seeing them as human beings who may be struggling or maybe not. And I had this teacher, Mr. Pickering, and he seen me. He didn't just see pissy, drug, whatever. He saw me. And I remember he used to say, stay back. And he'd, he'd have sandwiches and he'd give me sandwiches. But he'd, we'd talk about English. He'd say, you're really clever, really clever. And he told me a story. Like he was from Yorkshire and he left school at 15 and he went to work in the mines and then he went back to college when he was in his 30s. So he, he like met me, told me a human story. And I remember just thinking, this guy's fucking amazing. And I really like worked hard for him. Because I think when you meet somebody who cares, you work... Like, shouting at kids doesn't make a difference. Mm. Like, you punish me all you want. Detention me. I don't give a fuck. I'm going to say fuck you even more. But if you care, I don't want to be horrible to the teachers that care. I don't know about you guys, but I was like that. If you're a nice teacher, I tell everyone to shut up because I didn't want to hurt you, that teacher. And this guy was great. And um, I remember it was parent-teacher meeting. It was second year, so I was, in fo I was 14. And um, parent-teacher meeting came, and I was at the school... And he was dying to meet my mum and dad to tell them. And they didn't come because they never went, you know. And I was at, went home after, ashamed, parents went home. And there was a knock on the door on our house. And I opened the door and uh, I was Mr. Pickering. Hi, sir. <laughs> Hi, sir. What are you doing here? Uh, is your dad there? I was like, yeah. So my dad, I was like, dad. I was like, shit, he's drinking special brew. You know, so he goes to the door. Hello, my dad's acting all like fucking intelligent. It's my teacher, <laughs> Mr. Pickering. My dad's fucking half locked. His teeth are gone. The lock. But he's still acting like this. And I'm standing in the hallway, and I hear, I hear, and I hear Mr. Pickering say, "Your daughter is so talented. You should be ashamed of yourself that you're not there to see what she can do." Mm -hmm. And I stood in the hall and was like. Oh my God, this man, who didn't know me, like, um, I think, you know, some of the times people say to me, how did you get where you were? Like, I think he put a little spring in my heart, 
him and Miss Arkansas, a little spring mm. that kind of made me bounce back a little bit. That the little hope, the little fire that I had in my belly when I was small, like they kept it fi- going mm. when I really was, when it was really about to go out. The teachers have so much influence, don't they? Right. Like yeah. and when I was in school as well, I I didn't really get on well in secondary school. Wasn't that I didn't like history, geography, or these subjects. I loved them. I just didn't get on with the teachers because yeah. they didn't understand mm. what was going on and because there was misbehaviour and all these things, you know, um, and it was causing a lot of conflict for me. But when I was in college then, I got on really well with the lecturers mm. and I wanted to reward them. Yeah. So I remember for my master's, and I was, Gillian would tell you this, but um, because I was after getting a scholarship, I wanted to show them, you know, and I got on, I became friendly with some of them. And I think I'd like six modules on a dissertation and I aced every one of them and I wanted to show them that I really you know, um, appreciated that the time they give me, mm. you know. And even when I do them, we do training there with recruit prison officers, you know. And I always say to the prison officers, like, it's very hard to be hostile to somebody that's been nice to you. Mm. So when you're on the landing, you don't need to be falling over somebody. If you show a bit of an interest, be respectful. So true. It's true, isn't it? It's, yeah. But it's the same for, for teachers in school as well. Yeah. But I think that, like, they are working in a system where they are rewarded by the academic achievement of their class. I know. And that's all they're interested in, unfortunately. The, the league so, tables, yeah, yeah. The league tables yeah. of their skill. Even in... Sorry, go on. No, I just want to say, in, in where we're from, in Nakanahini, Towns Max Sweeney Community College is the secondary school. They do a lot of great programmes there. But when that league table came out, um, it was the only school in Cork that didn't have somebody to go to UCC, yeah. which was a sad because they do a lot of other stuff, and a lot of them went to PLC courses, mm. CIT, mm. but it looks terrible, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it doesn't do anything for the reputation no. of the people in the neighbourhood. You know, so it's a very unfair, but do you want to come in? Yeah, just going back to what you were saying there about the teachers, that the positive influences in your life, you don't really see them as, as the child. It's not until later on in the years mm. you can look back in your life and see the real positive people. You know, mm. as you were speaking there, like a... I was thinking of some of the people that were in my life. There would have been a, a youth worker now in the youth club that took a lot of interest in me and he could see what was going on at home and he, he gave me that extra little bit of care and attention. And there was also a teacher, you know, within the school. He was he was looked at as a strict teacher, but I see a different side of him. I could, I could see the real emotional, deep, soft side of him. Mm. A big, strong man now, like we were only kids in primary, but... Um, he actually gave a fuck. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And and, and it's, it's people like that really come in at the right time to show us when things are really bad that people are actually good. I know. You know that some people, they're pe- not everybody is bad, and that's what kind of gives us the strength today as well. You know, it gives us these nice attributes. You said you got some nice stuff for me. I know I got some great stuff for my own mother, but. You also become Katrina. Yeah. You know, that exactly. real authentic Katrina, the real person. Mm. And when you be start becoming more and more and more aware of life and your own core beliefs and your own ego and all these other things, and you start becoming yourself mm. with all, all these things getting in the way of life. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's why it, magic. Like. That's why in Cork, you know, we have the Cork Life Centre. Have oh you heard yeah. of that? Oh, you have, yeah, because I, I actually was involved in it. Uh, a funding program that funded the Cork Life Centre. Yeah, Center, so yeah. that's a school, an alternative informal education yeah. institution, but it's the academic achievement is great and all, but it's more about the psychosocial development of yeah. the young person too, and it's kind of moving away from that kind of banking model of education yeah. that you spoke about, like. I am the teacher and I'm going to deposit knowledge yeah. into your brain, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But if it, they work from, like, um, the critical social education yeah. model of youth work, you know? And I, I was down there on placement and volunteering and it was one of the best experiences I've ever had and I have a good relationship with them today. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. And the, the development is, is unreal for the kids. I've worked in teacher education here in Ireland, so um, in different countries we recruit teachers completely different than what we do in Ireland. So in Ireland, you, teachers don't even have to care. So there's no personality testing, there's no, there's no interview even. So a teacher just has to get the points to get into the course. And a lot of the time, like, someone who's getting like 500 points in maths, 
And science is not necessarily <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very social. Like, Do you know what I mean? Or or maybe that, that's not everybody, but the reality is like, you know, this in, in different models, there's different models in different countries. So uh, there's a really famous theorist called Passy Salberg and he's an educationalist. And he, I went to a talk of his and he, his daughter wanted to become a teacher in Finland. And she had the academic ability, but she failed the interview three three years in a row and the third time she was like why am I failing and they were like you don't demon this you want to teach for you you want to teach for you you don't care enough about them when you understand the impact that you're going to have on that human being then you're ready to become a teacher mm. but we don't have that in Ireland no, so we, and we're the most elite education a teaching group in un Ireland unreal and like told you the story about George Bull that I'll share with the audience oh, yeah. but um just because you get, you know, 600 points or you, you know, four first-class honours doesn't mean you know fucking everything or you're great at everything. But George Bull is the UCC, he's a legend from UCC. He's um, famous for Boolean algebra and they use that to create code for apps and applications and, mm. and stuff in this day and age. But the, the library is named after him. So he was this world-famous mathematician. We lived in Ballinlock in Cork City and he got a cold one day cycling to work in the UCC. So back in the day, they thought cold, cured a cold. So his wife laid him in bed and poured cold water <laughs> over him until he died. That's, that's what, six, that's what so, 600 points does for you. So we'll, we'll take a break for 10 minutes and we'll come back. <laughs> I, have a, I, have a fan, I have a fan club. <laughs> this feels good. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> you said a while ago you can sing and dance as well, so we oh, make yeah. a song or a minute. <laughs> you have to pay me for that now. Yeah. But, um, we'll pick it up, right? Yeah. So you had a child quite young. Yeah, so I was wild, crazy, and then I got pregnant. I was 15 and I got pregnant, which is an ideal, mm. especially when you haven't had, uh, you know, great role models for parents. And um, my parents kicked me out, so... I ended up squatting in a couple of flats in, in Birmingham and uh, me and my son's dad were trying to like be grown ups, mental, but like I ended up, so the council came and kicked us out of the last flat, but because I was 15, they put me in a mother and baby hostel. Um, it's funny, because you have the mother and baby homes here. Yeah. But it was like this, it was so lonely. It was the worst period I think of my life like I'm pregnant haven't got a clue about anything to do with babies or I know haven't got a maternal bone in my body I love my kids I, I but I really wasn't the girl that was gonna have 10 kids and mm. marry some bloke that wasn't me and so yeah I was, ended up uh, yeah in the hostel sitting in this little room what, was, I, that, what was that like it was awful you know like all of the girls were like me or worse. So we're all kind of wild and it's like fucking wild animals in there, like fighting each other and robbing each other, but also like full of pride and not being able to say how you're feeling. I know this sounds, it is sad. Like no one visited me in there, never. I was in there for 18 months on my son's birth certificate. It says 226 to 228 Broad Street, Acock Stream, Birmingham, because he was born there, you know, like that was his, and so, yeah, it was really lonely. And it just kind of affirmed to me, you know, that I really had no one, even though I was with his dad. His dad didn't care. You know, like I was dreaming mm -hmm. yeah, that I was going to have this amazing life when I knew that it wasn't going to happen. But I think what I said at the start was when I was younger, I was really hopeful as a young, you know, like, oh, things are going to get better. Mm -hmm. And at that point, that was gone. Like it was pure, bleak, dark. And, um, How did you cope with that? I used drugs, drank, ran away, went raving, cried. Had your social services in your life? I, um, well, you, in that place you had to have because I was underage. Mm -hmm. So they monitored you all the way from the beginning. So like you had to like, you had to prove that you could parent before they'd give you a place, like a flat. So yeah, they were there from the beginning. <laughs> oh, does like a child bring up a child? It's it's so like yeah. when you look at it, even your own par like your own parents and you said it there two minutes ago. You didn't have great role models. Mm. 
you know, like even the people that were over the, the social care back then, like looking at something like that, it must have been really, really, really sad. You know, it was, you know, like because I had such a hard life, I think up to then, you can't you can't see yourself from the outside in. You know, like you can't. So you just are yourself. So I never walked around going, how am I going to be a mother? I'm only 15. I was just 15 and having a baby and just getting on with it. But I remember like, because, you know, like you're not, you're not allowed to ask for help in them things or reveal stuff about yourself to people or your vulnerabilities. Like I didn't know how to make bottles or change nappies. And I remember I had to watch girls doing it to learn. So I had John and I went home and I robbed loads of the bottles from the hospital. You know, Karen Gate little glass bottles, 700 of them. So I didn't, cause I didn't know what the fuck I was gonna do. And uh, when they were running out, I was like, what the hell? I didn't know you had to do this thing where you did this and there was mills and everything. I was like, what the hell? Mm. So everything was just a learning. And like, I did love John, you know, but I, I didn't know, I'd love to be, and I know he'll probably hear this and he knows I love him. Like, he's my greatest achievement in life. He's 28, he's going to be a dad. He's amazing. But a professional he, soccer player. A professional soccer player. I hate talking about that, because, like, that isn't who he is, though. Yeah. He's a loving, kind young man. He's mm. caring. He's strong. He's fit. He's really handsome. <laughs> like his mum. <laughs> Not his fucking dad. <laughs> I hope he hears it. <laughs> anyway. I don't really, that resentment's gone, I swear. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'd love to say, I'd love to be the, I'd love to be that mother who was like, and the love flooded in, and then I changed, and I became like the Waltons. No, that's not what happened, I struggled. I felt the love, and I, I used to look at him and go, oh my God, he's mine. I hadn't a clue what I was doing. I used to hang around at shops with him in his buggy. I have photographs of us, me in my shower suit, pulled up to here. It's blue buggy, John's there with his cool hat on and his fucking fake Timberland shoes when he's only six months old. Because I didn't know what to do. Like, what do you do? So mm. I just did what I did, but I had a baby. And then I, I got a flat off the council. John was like one. And I got a flat off the council and his dad moved in and it was just awful. Violent. I was violent. He was violent. We were selling drugs from the flat. It's my brothers, and we we're all like a little family of shit drug dealers, to be honest. And I hate saying that, because I'm like, oh shit, the academics are gonna hear this. They might not publish my papers. <laughs> Fuck them, published enough now. Mm. <laughs> but I am ashamed of that. But then I, you know, ad education gave me an understanding of like, I had no other option. Like literally, another life was like a black, a black space. There wasn't like a choice for me or anybody like me. There's something what Gillian said just on the say podcast. I was mm. just going to say, say No, I'll leave you. When you know better, you can She'll do better. You you, you, yeah. She'll kill you if you leave me, sir. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes you know better and you can't do better. Well, mm. Jesus, you were yeah, I sometimes you know better, hands. but you can't do better because mm. you haven't got the spring in your heart, you know, you haven't got the people to empower you, or the services, yeah. or the education opportunities, even when you know better. But, but back then, I didn't know anything different. So my brother, yeah, so it's my brother was norm, living yeah. in our little box room, and he was selling E, and yeah. we were getting robbed, and we were robbing, and we were doing all these things, and John was learning to walk. He walked for 10 months, he was great. I was so proud of him, but it was all chaotic, chaotic. I was working then, so I had my book, had me flat, had me, oh yeah, social welfare. That was the best thing ever. Mm. That was what you wanted, cash in hand job. Worked in a little cafe, 200 quid or whatever it was, in the hands, don't tell the social welfare, don't tell anybody what you're doing. Don't tell no one, because they'll take it all away from you. Even though you're fucking poor already, and you're struggling, but like, you're afraid that they're gonna take this poverty away from you. Mm. And uh, so I struggled, and me and his dad split up, and I was really, really chaotic. For two years of John's life, I was so bad, so low, suicidal every day. Just, it, I felt like life had just put a load of shit on me, and then I just put, added a load of shit on it, and I couldn't get out. And I did have this sense inside that there's gotta be something different than this. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like when you're little, like you see the pop stars and Madonna and Michael Jackson, even though he's a weirdo, mm. you know, you see all these people who are living this great life and you're like, that, why are they getting, there must be something. 
because people are talking about it, but I was broken. Mm. And uh, my oh. parents had moved back to Ireland. Yeah. So my dad had done a prison sentence, another one, drunk driving. And he got out on bail. And instead of facing the consequences, they legged it to Ireland, back to Ireland. Because we'd always come back and forwards. Mm. And they'd gone, come back. And um, my dad actually got sober then. And so he came to England. I was in a bad, bad way, not looking after John properly, not looking after myself, like no electricity in the house. Like one night we'd got out of our heads and painted the walls green. It was really crazy and chaotic. And um, my dad came and he took John. So he took John to Ireland. And John was like four. And um, I stayed in England for about six months on my own and was really, really just lost and broken. And I came to Ireland for a visit. And I remember going into my dad's living room and for the first time ever in my whole life, there was like calm in my dad's house. And my mum was still mad, still smoking weed and all. But they were sober, do you mm. know what I mean? They weren't chaotic. And my dad had all these AA books, pure addict, didn't just have one, had 700 on the table, <laughs> looking for the right answer each day. Bill see how Bill sees it. No, just for today. No, <laughs> it's not the right one. But I remember thinking something is here that wasn't here before. Mm. And I, I said to my dad, can I come here? And he said, oh, yeah, you, you can come if you want to come. We don't want to let John go. We love John. And he was loving John. And I was like, right, I went straight back to England with my ma, went using went crazy on a bend and my mum was sober. She ended up taking E in the middle of Birmingham. Oh my God, <laughs> it's another story. My brother nearly killed me for taking her out. But anyway, we got on the boat back and I met this addict guy on the boat on the way back from Dublin, from Dublin One. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in love. <laughs> the accent, he's amazing. He was crazy. Everybody I ever went for, apart from you, Dave. Hey. <laughs> was crazy because uh, we we go for what we feel we can achieve mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing because they're feeling like they can achieve you too so i was really messed up but i came to ireland and my dad was like like a mainstay my dad actually became my dad's mm -hmm. and that was a blessing and i can talk about him being like this liar and the cheat because he was still a liar and a cheat like aa doesn't take alcoholism out of the person or NA or CA or whatever A you fucking go to. It just stops you drinking and gives you tools, but you have to use the tools. So my dad used the tools a lot and he made amends to me. Mm. And that's what matters to me, is that he made amends to me and the way he made amends to me is he gave me a home, he gave my son so much love and he gave me the opportunity to, to recover from what they'd done mm. and from what I'd done. Do you know when you come back to Dublin and stay with your father, what? Age were you? What year was this? I, I was 21, so it was uh, two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say the year. <laughs> it was 23 years ago, 44 now. Yeah. So oh, 1998. What? Well, yeah. So it came and it was like, well, your maths is bad. Is it 23 what? years? 23 years ago. So you're not. Did you say 88? Oh yeah, you're right. Your maths is good. Sorry, yeah. my mind. <laughs> Yeah, I remember arriving actually, and it was all this like anti drugs thing in Dublin. So it was, mm. it was like, uh, videos, get them out. I was like, what the fuck is this? Mm. Concerned you know parents against drugs. Yeah, yeah, people marching. Yeah. So I moved into Dublin One, like straight away. I got a flat in uh, Summerhill in Dublin One, yes. Yeah. Found my, my grandmother home. was from there actually. Yeah, found my spiritual home, like at that time. Because it was just people like me, they just spoke different, but it was the same. Get your so lone parents. Rent allowance was different. Like, you know, you got a council flat in Birmingham, you got rental flat, rent allowance in Dublin. So I got rent allowance, got me a little flat, you know, cleaning Connolly Station. That was my job, like. Mm. But I'd started to go to therapy. I started to try and find peace. Started to recover from my trauma, but the trauma I'd inflicted as well. Did you look at your dad and think, like, there actually is another way? Yeah. I actually, it was, the hope came back on when I seen him. The fact that, like, he was the worst addict I ever met, in my mind. And I met a lot of bad addicts in my time, mm. but he was the worst. And it's probably because he was my dad and my mom was the worst. And my mom struggled. She got sober and she didn't, and she did, and she did, and she relapsed. But there were times where she was well as well. And so it was like, wow, these two absolutely, they were like the bottom of the barrel. If they can get their shit together, anyone can, mm. is what I felt. So it was hopeful. 
And there was all these different talking and going on and apologizing and love you. Now, they always said, we love you. You never went to bed without saying, I love you. Even if they were fucking killing you, they'd still, you know, so there was loads of love. And it gave me, you know, a bit of a, it gave me a spring. And my dad was like, I got, it's a really hard thing to talk about because my dad was abusive in, his, in the way he was powerful in my life and he, he took advantage of that and he, he mistreated me even in recovery but he also provided me with a safe place to actually navigate the world and so I'm grateful for that but I'm also angry and mm. I think that complication of like loving someone who hurts you but needing them is something that's been a mainstay of my whole life mm. is actually not wanting to leave but having to leave and then going back and wanting the good but not the bad. I think that's the complication that I continually live with. But at that time I lived with, so I'm grateful, but I, I, can't, I can't ignore everything, mm. you know what I mean? Mm. But I got well, I started, to, I, got, I started therapy. I remember this woman, Mary, she was fucking brilliant. This nun, I didn't know she was a nun. So talk about sex and everything with her. I didn't know. I should have known from her shoes. She didn't have a thing on there, but you know the way they wear them kind of square shoes? A pair of struts. Yeah, I was like, I remember one time, like, you know, pure selfish for about a year talking about me, 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 me. And I was like, Mary, what do you do? I'm a nun. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like, did you judge me? You know, yeah. she's probably getting off on the shit I was telling her. <laughs> Only joking. We'll have to cut that bit out. Yeah, cut it out, cut it out. <laughs> But anyway, she, she was, that was unbelievable for me. Like I could not recommend, um, like I was in treatment as well. I did a treatment center and that was fucking awful, mm. awful. Um, but the therapy that I did with Mary was like the absolute, was the thing that really provided me with, I know now from psychology, like I didn't have a secure base. Like how I see myself and how I feel is that like I'm a really strong, brave, courageous woman. I'm intelligent, I'm capable, but I'm also fractured. And the fractures run deep into my foundation. Mm. And there were really wide, really wide earthquakes had gone in there. And like my work with Mary actually really helped me. She was just this safe space that I could go to all the time and start to close them and learn. And it was like unconditional, the relationship with her. And actually what she gave me was not only the ability to, I suppose, heal and cra and solve some of that. What, no, what she didn't give it me, I gave it me by continuing to go mm. despite how hard it was. But also like, I have to say like my husband also gave me that as well. So like she, she was amazing. So I met, I met her, I was in therapy with her for three years or something, fucking crazy, in and out of crazy relationship, doing mad things, but trying. My dad was doing well and John was doing well. And then um, I met Dave and it was like, I don't know, something changed. <laughs> I'm not gonna say too much about him, but it was like that work with her gave me the ability to be loved by somebody. I'd never ever had that. I'd always gone for the unavailable person, mm -hmm. the person who could never love me because I wasn't worth it. And then I met Dave and it was like, I actually met someone, I was actually able to be loved and lucky for me, I am pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> he decided to love me as well. Mm. Sure, why wouldn't he? Mm. And so you, know, you make a good point there. It's like, um, do you know when you do a bit of personal development and you look after yourself, the, yeah. the right person will come into your life at that time yeah. when, when, you're, when you're ready and when it's supposed to happen. Yeah. If you try to chase that when you're not ready, it will never happen for you. No. Do you know, and so there's somebody for everybody and it's just a matter of time, really. Mm. But do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into the education piece? Because it's a huge part of your life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know what? I was cleaning. I'd love to say, like, it was a strategic decision to make a better life for myself. <laughs> no, everything's fucking accidental. Uh, you know, I remember, and jealousy got me there, I think, actually, to be honest. So I'd done a few courses. I'd done a parenting course. I'd done a personal development course. I'd been in Solskjaer, ACRG, I'd tried all these things. And then um, I remember I was on the Connell Street and I met this girl, Karen, 
And uh, I was like, what are you doing? She's a lone parent like me. It's Thursday, going into pennies, spend my book, the usual, mm. as you did. Broke yeah. them by Saturday, looking for a lens till the week after. And I said to her, what are you doing? She says, I'm in Trinity, been studying law. And I was like, fuck off. <laughs> She's like, no, 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 I swear to God. I, I, I got in, I did this thing called the Access Program. I was like, what? I only knew people who went in there robbing. Mm. Not lying. Now it's laptops, back then it was bikes. Mm. <laughs> And I didn't think they let us in. Like, it looked like a big fucking closed prison or something. Mm. And she said to me, um, no, no, I got in through the access program. She told me about the Trinity access program. And you know what? I think one thing that's overlooked with people like us is like the fucking resilience, mm. the cheek, the neck we have. You know, but I, wa I was like, she fucking went there? Yeah. She's worse than me, I'm going over there. No, I'm only joking, Karen. <laughs> so I went over, I went over that minute. I knocked on the door of the Trinity Access Programme. This woman answered, Irene, a little poshy. Oh, my God. I was like, excuse me, Karen Dowler told me that she's going to Trinity and she's studying law, and what's the story? And I, can I get... She's like, come in, come in. And she's like, tell me about yourself. And I was like, wow. <laughs> How have you got all day, as you know? Anyway, the, you know what touched me, though? She said to me, oh, wow. You're absolutely amazing. And, like, to have this, like, posh woman in Trinity say that. Mm. You know, the springs, Mr. Pickering, mm. yeah, you know, it was like Miss Arkinson, mm. my dad now. It's like, oh, fuck, there's another one there pushing me on, like, bouncing me back. So I, I applied. I didn't even know what it was. Didn't know it was full time. Didn't know if I'd lose my book. That was the most important concern. <laughs> Would I get my rent allowance? Yeah. But I was like, I'm fucking doing it, like, whatever. And I'm lucky, like, I think when you've lived in poverty and you have that fuck it attitude, it can get you places, it can get you in bad places. But for me, Gives you got, a brass neck, like, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, brass neck. But um, something you said You're there. not afraid to ask for things like that. No. No, definitely, because we don't want to... just demand them. The shy boy, we get no sweets as this, yeah? Yeah. But something you said there around different people kind of instilling a little bit of belief, but, like, you know... All through my life, my mum and dad used to always say, no, you were intelligent. But you know, I just think, like, everybody says that to their kids, do you know what no, I mean? So yeah. I didn't really believe it. But certain officers in car prison used to really say, like, you've got a, lot, you've got a brain there and you, ha you can hold a conversation way different to the people that you're hanging around with. Um, I think if my wife used to say to me when I started dating Gillian, you know, we started texting over Facebook first. And, um, As you do. Yeah, and she says, and she, she used to say, like... Um, there's something different about you, you know, you, you talk, you speak differently, you have different interests, you know. Oh, but I they think all say that, don't they, Gillian? I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was chatting up. <laughs> but I think uh, when, when it's not your mum and dad telling you, <laughs> yeah. you, you start to believe a little and bit more. And she's really good looking. Yeah, she's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but I think when and she's 43, no, it's oh, just yeah. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go, 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 yeah. But, um, but like, w when you hear it outside your family, then you think, fuck it, m maybe there is potential. Yeah. Maybe I can be something yeah, different, yeah. you know? So it was similar experiences it. in yeah, that sense. Yeah, it was. Do you know, for the people um, that have never been through university, can you briefly explain what the Access Programme is? So, like, some really, really clever person who's probably very middle class, they actually emailed me recently, recognised somewhere along the line that your potential is not measured by the leaving cert. And actually, you can be really poor and actually leave school at 12 or have a baby at 15 and have the potential to be fucking amazing. And so these people actually, you know, in Trinity, for example, this, this person um, created a program which was like, we're going to let some poor kids in. We're going to see this experiment and see if they can do this. But no, they didn't see it as an experiment. They actually knew mm -hmm. that there's actually the system's unfair and that there's so much talent out there that's not getting tapped into and not being allowed to flourish. So they created a program called the Trinity Access Program, whereas it's a year-long uh, foundation course, a preparation course. Now, the irony is, back when I got in, um, you didn't really have to have a lot of <laughs> education to get in, whereas now it's changed a lot. So I, pro I wouldn't get in today. But back then, I was, uh, it, it, it was created to support people like me, like people who were doing, like, apprenticeships or had gone into carpentry or you know the way like when you come from the street or you're working class people go you're going to be a great plumber mm. you're going to shovel shit your whole life and you're going to be amazing at it mm. and they never say oh you're going to be an academic mm. and you're going to publish an amazing you know so mm. it was for people that had been told that they couldn't be and so they could go in and you do a year 
in this course and basically they teach you how to write academically, do maths and then you can pick different subjects so you can try English and what it's like in university. So I, that was the foundation course. Now there's, there's a few of them around now but they're not actually funded by the state. The state actually doesn't agree with them. So the Higher Education Authority doesn't think that they're a, a, a va something that universities should be doing, but the Trinity are so affluent that they can actually get outside funders to fund them, or they can choose what they do with their funding, so they fund this, but not all universities do. So just to put that in context, because like it would be great if everybody here who wanted to could go to one of these, but I they can't. I didn't know that, because no. in Cork we have a new CC, Olive Bourne is the access know, officer, yeah. and then in um, Munster Technological University, formerly CIT, You've uh, dared to Yeah. I thought I know like that everybody had, every no. college had a. No, they don't all have access programs. And like MTU doesn't have an access program. And UCC doesn't have an, a they have an access office. Yeah. But they don't have a year. So there's some that have a yeah. year, but you have an access office. There's different routes to get in. Mm -hmm. So there's the higher education access route, which you can get in through if you've gone to, say, a DESH school or a school that's disadvantaged. You can get extra points. You can it. get reduced points entry. Yeah, or yeah. else, if you're a mature student over 23, you can do an interview and go in. But there's no, the year long process preparation courses are not actually a state yeah, initiative I and see. they should be mm -hmm. for people like me who actually could never have gone directly into trinity i would mm -hmm. have broken and died because i just didn't have the confidence no. or the words and i was chavy still mm -hmm. am but at the time i needed something to actually lift me not just um, intellectually but confidence wise and emotionally it wasn't therapy or anything but there was a connection there so you didn't feel alone because going to somewhere like Trinity when you're like me is hard. I was hard. just about to ask because, like, I don't know what your experiences was, but my first kind of few months in UCC, um, in early recovery, I kind of like imposter syndrome. Did you have that? Like, Trinity obviously is like the most poshest college we have in yeah, Ireland, you know? Yeah. And the with most all respect, poshest, yeah. With all respect, is. too, yeah? It is the poshest. Yeah, how, how, how did you navigate that? I didn't, I didn't navigate it well. I actually, well, I. You know what? It's like that. Remember I was saying like them three journeys. So like, there's that child that's always there, the trauma child. You know, that's always kind of like a bit afraid and not trusting anybody. Then there's this, there's this other one that's like, oh, I'm amazing. <laughs> Look how clever you are. You're really good at this. So there's this other journey going on. But there's this me in the middle who's like going like, okay, how do I, how do I get through, like using the street, how do I get through this? Who's the lecturers I have to get to know? What's the, what's the money situation here? Who can I get the grants from? You know, I'm going in with this, but then I'm like meeting all these really, really affluent kids. And I'm so sad for myself. Yeah. I'm so angered as well. Like they're talking about couscous and skiing. <laughs> they know like the capital of, is it Brussels or Berlin? <laughs> Brussels is the capital of Berlin. I said this to you. Belgium. Belgium. Shit. See? <laughs> they have all this capital. I didn't mm. know what capital was, but they have all this experience that just, they just talk. They're so confident. Not all of them. Like, mm. I'm sweeping statements, but there's just a, a wealth of difference. And when you're in that, and you've got fake tan still on your fucking hands, and your hair's up here, and you say cunt, and you don't fucking know the equation of a line, you're like, oh my God, I'm never gonna get through this. And, mm. and the best way I dealt with that was just like, get my head down, do the work, what's the work, what's the work, what's the work, do the work, don't really get to know anyone, and just, just plow on. But like, so, you know, what I'll say to you is this, right? Everybody has shit. Their shit is just a different color to my shit. Mm. It's not as heavy, but like, as I got, well, it's probably not different, that's a bit weird. <laughs> I didn't go in the toilets looking at it. But you know what I mean? Like, yeah. as a, humans are humans, mm. you know? And um, I actually, the one thing about Trinity, right? It's an amazing education. It's fucking beautiful. You feel, like, I still walk in there and go, oh my God, this is so amazing. But it also makes me really angry that there's not more people like me there, mm. and you, and you, and you, because, like, it's, it's a failing. Like, it's not, like, people see it as charity. It's like, oh, let the poor kids in. I, brang, I brought so much to that institution. I changed so much. I brought so much intellectual capability and street knowledge and capacity to inform programs that if you don't diversify, you can't have it. So, you know, Trinity is an amazing place and I really enjoyed it, but I struggled. It was like it fractured me because I didn't belong. I still don't belong. That's why I left. I got a full-time job. I got a permanent job, but I left because I just couldn't. I couldn't be involved in a place that actually 
I was in the access office and I was trying to develop programs to help people like me, but then I'd be having to go out and like meet sponsors and wear fancy dresses and rugby player meet rugby players and get them to donate a million quid so they could buy into the elite institution mm. while like the poor kids are at the back of the campus and there's only 20 of them getting in when there should be hundreds of them. Mm. I'm on a rant now. Yeah, yeah, you're You need funny. to stop me. But you're, you're skipping into the employment piece, but obviously you but have to do a whole, a whole lot of education yeah. to get there. Do you want to tell us about the degree you did oh and yeah. the postgraduate so psychology. stuff? Psychology. Psychology was my degree. So when you do an access programme, you get to choose things. So it was great. I think all kids should get a chance to be able to test out college courses. <laughs> so I, and I, honest to God, like I... I am bright. Like, I never knew it, though. When I started, I didn't know I was that... I was bright. I thought, like, that what I'd been taught, that you failed school, you failed... You didn't get an education. That meant you were stupid, and you were never getting anywhere. So I actually personified that. And then I went to Trinity, and I was, like, getting good grades and all the information. I was like, oh, my God! And that's how you develop. And that's what Shakespeare said. And that's what the law's all about. I was like a fucking sponge. And, like... It was just unbelievable. So I did psychology. I got offered all different degrees, but I took psychology. The reason I took it was because it was only 10 hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's because I had a dream. Yeah, no, it was 10 hours a week. And I had a kid, and I was on my own. And the reality is I had to leave John on his own to go to college. Like, John was seven, like. I had to leave him, and he had to come home on his own because I had no one to mind him. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I had the Vinnies coming around, giving me money to get through it. But like, so I had, you know, I, I chose 10 hours a week because it was the least hours. And I did love all the stuff. I could have studied anything because I was that alive by yeah. education. But Trinity, uh, psychology was my, my thing. And actually, you know what was mad? Like I was so lonely and so different in one breath. But then in another breath, I was like getting these amazing grades. And the lecturer was like, you were brilliant. And I was like, oh my God, I'm brilliant. <laughs> so I was like this insecure, lonely, scared, different. And then, oh my God, this is a lie. I am fucking amazing. And I am so clever and good at this. And that, that my whole life has been teaching me the opposite. So it was like these two journeys going through it. And the more separate I felt, the better I felt as well, because I was like, I'm really good at this. Mm. So I ended up, I graduated with a first class honours. Full of boss. <laughs> people might Hello. not, yeah. People not, they don't, people don't know what that is. Because mm. like when you call, I wouldn't even know what a fucking degree is. Didn't even know what BA meant. I thought it was big ass. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, um, as you were going through the course and you were hitting third year and fourth year and that belief, the imposter syndrome, I'm not good enough, I'm stupid. And all, that, did that change when you were starting to notice your grades were the highest in the class? And well, they weren't the highest, so I'm yeah. not going to steal yeah. them from Amy. Yeah, yeah. She was higher than me and so was <laughs> Milena. That was but, it, though. But like... <laughs> did, did, <laughs> did you feel it was a big did, class too? Yeah. Did it change your 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 understanding of yourself? No, it just it stayed there. You know what's funny? Like I said this to you earlier. Mm. I think when we t so like when you talk about class, there's a thing called intersectionality. Mm. You know, you mentioned it earlier. So when people talk about access to education, they just say like access for travellers, access for migrants, access for working class people, as if you're just in this one group and that's it, that's all, you're, and you're just dealing with stuff from that. And as for me, I wasn't working class, like we said, we're underclass, he's working class a little bit, me and you connect <laughs> on that level, I'd say. You know, the layers are there. So like when I was going through it, that underclass side was still there. Mm. So, like, that's a healing in itself. So, like, that's the journey of, like, myself healing from the traumas of my own life and the life that I've led. And so, yeah, like, it's complicated. It's a, it's a complicated process. Yeah, I'm feeling great. So I've got all this confidence and belief in myself, but I still have the, the fractures. And they're closing. But, like... Getting good at education does close them, but it doesn't fix them. Actually, you can run away. You can run away in achievements. Like, I remember getting my, my PhD, and it meant nothing. My dad has, my dad has died from, from drinking and drugging. Like, it meant nothing to me. I remember standing in front of Mary Robinson. I know who she is. Mm -hmm. And she's speaking to me in Latin. And I'm like, wow, this is the highest you can go in education. This is Ireland's top institution. I'm level 10. The wheel goes from one to 10. There's no higher than this. And I feel nothing. 
I do feel proud of myself and mm. my, but I feel I feel better about the fact that I have a fucking happy marriage, yeah. and my kids are so good yeah. than that. Mm. So yeah, like education is great, and people celebrate me. Oh God, broken girl, look at she's, and it is amazing that I've done that. But that doesn't heal you. Mm. Doesn't heal you. The things no. that heal you is like going home to Dave mm. and making the tea. Yeah. As yeah. I don't make the tea every night. Yeah. But you know, like having the dinner with yeah. the kids. Like my, we've had to, like I didn't make it easy for myself. So in second year I had another baby. So I met Dave in first year. Mm. And then I got pregnant within a very short time. Because I knew, we knew. But um, I had a baby in second year and then I had a baby also in my PhD. So I didn't, I think also the thing about people like me is we don't make things, you know, uh, trauma and drama our central tenants in our <laughs> lives. And if it's not coming from the outside, it can come very much so from the inside. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not used to doing things easily. Yeah. And if it's not easy, if it's a fight outwardly, I'm fighting it, but also I'll create the fight. Mm -hmm. And so having a baby, having two boys, my lovely, amazing children, who actually, I cannot be more proud of the fact that I am a great mother yeah. than everything else I've ever done. Like we sat at the table the other day and my 13 year old said this to you, I think I did the other day, he was like, uh, Belgium is a pointless cult country, ma. He's 13, I was like, for fuck's sake, I don't even know what Belgium is. <laughs> but like, I'm looking at him thinking, this is, this is what healing is. Mm -hmm. Sitting at the table with the boys, Dave's there, we're having shepherd's pie that was pre-cooked somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably fighting over the last bit of ice in the freezer. And then the two of my lads are going, uh, point, Belgium's a pointless country. <laughs> and then the other lad's going, yeah, it's something to do with the wars that Napoleon had. Yeah. And I'm like, did Napoleon have anything to do with Belgium? <laughs> so I know psychology, I know it really well, but everything else, like you said, is gone. But like, what I'm saying is the achievements is, is actually that for me. Mm. It's and always been that. That's a proud moment for you because you can relate to that to your own upbringing and yeah. you say, oh my God, look what we're after developing here. Yeah. And when you look, and it, you stopped that, it's like Cycle. the ripple effect. Yeah. It stopped. It has. It stopped. So their kids will, yeah. will, will progress because of your change, you yeah. know, and it just continues to get better exactly. and better, you know. So, and we, myself and Nicole, like uh, when I look back in, in my own childhood and, and, and like it's, it's, just to see your kids know. and know that they're not going to go through the same traumatic experiences in school, out in the streets, not having nothing, not having the clothes that everybody else, like, that's an amazing feeling. And, and, and that's worth it all. Yeah, it is. And like, even today when we had dinner and I met your yeah. son, I'm like, wow. Like, it, it, to be aware and of the privilege that you have is just yeah. amazing. And to be able to live in that regularly. I live in that regularly. Mm. I do live in it regularly. But I also... I'm still fractured, you know, in the middle of it. There's still the potential for the, the shaky foundations that have to be minded. Well, or maybe they won't always have to be, but I'm okay yeah. with that. I have a great husband mm -hmm. who actually knows all the details yeah. and we talk and share and he'll mind me if I need it and I'll mind him. And so, like, it can't get any better than that mm -hmm. in some ways. Do you want to tell yeah. us a little bit about what your life is like now and maybe some plans you have for the future? So my life now is busy because uh, I'm a, yeah. So basically my life now, I'm an academic in Maynooth. I'm a lecturer, so it's a mad You're thing. the second Maynooth lecturer we've had on, oh, Mick wow. O'Brien. Oh yeah, very good, yeah, very yeah, good. Yeah. Um, I'm the better one though. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Only joking, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what my life looked like. So, you know, that anger that, um, so when I finish, so when you go to Trinity and, you're involved with all these pushy people, right? It's kind of like, what am I gonna do now? And I remember day, days we were working class, like carpenter, it's like, get a job. You're gonna get a job someday, ain't ya? I know I have money, but anyway, he said to me, uh, so after, so like, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was very angered. Like once you become educated, like I genuinely think that anyone who's been privileged enough to be educated has a responsibility to use their critical thinking to make sure society is fair. 
It's your absolute, there's no fucking cop out if you've been educated and you can think critically about whatever it is to ignore the fact that there's stratification in our system, that poor kids don't get the same opportunity and then poor kids can be from wherever. Combined poverty, migrants, asylum, it's not, it's not okay. And so like when, I, and I didn't know them words back when I mm. finished, but I know that that was in me, the anger around like, but also like realizing that he, he, I have a gift like, I've a, uh, this is a gift, and I need to use it in the right way. So, like, originally when I finished my PhD, I was like, I need to do, like, I need to be amazing now, and, like, do what all the other posh kids do. And then I couldn't fit into that because it wasn't, like, so I was doing a neuroscience thing, and I was like, oh, my God, this is not helping anybody. And then I got a job as a postdoc, and I started developing activities in universities that help, that are targeting people like me. But also, I started to learn that, you know what, with the, the degree I have and the language I can use and the capabilities I have, I can also communicate academically. And the language of, the language of policy makers is not this. They're not going to listen to this podcast probably because they're like pretending a lot of mm. the time. But they'll listen when you publish in a really strong academic journal mm. or when you get a grant from the Irish Research Council. And my street recognises that. My fucking capacity to go, where do you win here? because that's what I learned from my mom and dad and from my mm. street. So I was able to, I've been able to use that to kind of go, I'm actually gonna use this now to try my best to change the world. Like I wanna change the world. Mm. Like that's my responsibility. I've been given this and I'm privileged enough to be able to, I suppose, use my, so what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in my life and my work life is I, I get funding, to develop programs that help working class kids, migrants, asylum seekers, travelers, to actually access, to empower them, to actually be able to see that they can be whatever they want to be. And if they choose not to be, that's great. And I've done that in loads of ways. Mm. Oh, you can just read about it. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, it, it's true what you said, you know, if you have the privilege that you have and I have, that uh, you have to use that to you know, create awareness. I think that's what we do on the podcast yeah. as well, yeah. with the help of everybody in the room, because mm -hmm. we need support from outside. Like, you know, we need uh, people empowering us and people to support us, you know. So I just want to thank you for coming on. Give a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.